Be thou my vision, O Lord of my life. I need the Lord to be thou my vision, do you? Good morning and Sabbath blessing to everyone. Welcome to our Sabbath school study, Bible study. And I know that you are just as excited as I am about the lesson. You know, we have done a lot of lessons that are sometimes not easily understood, a little bit complicated. But this one, I think, is simple. And I hope we don't overcomplicate it because it's all about the mission of salvation. It's simple. God created beauty and perfection, but disobedience caused disruption. See, God is a relational God. He created humanity for relationship. But something happened and caused a disruption in that relationship. And then God set out on a plan to restore that relationship because he's a relational God. Let us pray. Holy Father in heaven, we thank you for life the beauty of your truth. And now as we turn to your word to study, we ask for divine help that you may give us reasoning, 
understanding, clarity in thinking, and that most of all we may respond in believing faith, trusting and resting completely in your amazing grace. Then, Lord, we ask that by your Spirit you'll teach us from your word that which we know not. Give us, Lord, that which we have not. Work in us to make us what you desire for us to be and we are not. A people prepared for heaven and useful and usable here on earth to bring others to a saving relationship with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To that end, forgive our sins and abide with us now and have thine own way, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This quarter we are studying, what is the topic of this quarter's lesson? All right. God's mission, my mission. God's business is my business. God's business is our business. Jesus said when he was here, I must be about my father's business. So we as his children should be about our father's business. And did anyone read the introductory to the lesson study? Not this lesson, but to the entire quarter. I find it fascinating because it is true. There is a problem, and we recognize that there's a problem. And what do we do? We think about it. We strategize about it. And we make plans about it. And while the problem is still there, we are still planning and executing figuring out to do it, and we bring in speakers, we bring in the experts, the professionals, to tell us how do we go about fixing this issue. And sometimes we want to be so focused on getting the method, the methodology, the strategy so right, we don't want to be distracted, so we build us a, fa a, a facility so to block out the distraction so we can focus to figure out how we must go about the business of the situation, the issue that we just built the building not to see. And oh, by the way, there, there's a problem. We form a committee. Now we need to have a president or, a, or an administrator over the, that, that, that program that we just created. And that, that president or leader needs some assistance. And here it is, all the resources and time is spent on building a program, not dealing with the issue. The issue is really simple. Sin caused separation. And Jesus said about the business of restoring humanity into fellowship with God. In Genesis chapter 3, in Genesis 1 and 2, we see God created and all things were good and beautiful and perfect. But disobedience caused separation. And as we studied last week, we realized that the old plan of salvation was not an afterthought. Because God, being God, know all things. He know the end from the beginning. And he knew that he would create humanity for relationship, but they would disobey. And just when they disobey, because I still want that relationship, I have a plan to restore them. And we see in Genesis 3 that God set in motion that plan. Because the Bible tells us that he was slain from the found, before the foundation of the world. And as a Bible student, we study and we realize that it's only now in the New Testament era that Jesus came, the incarnation, because as we talked about last week, sister, and you rightly said, God had to take on humanity because God cannot die. But the wages of sin is death, and therefore a life needed to be shed. Life needed to be taken. Blood needed to be shed. And God has always tried to reveal to humanity the plan of salvation. He did this in Genesis. He did it in Exodus. In the wilderness experience, God is revealing his plan of salvation. But we can't comprehend it all at once, so therefore we have what is called progressive truth. The gospel has always been the same. It's the everlasting gospel. And what is that gospel? Speak to me. What is the gospel? 
of Jesus Christ because it's all about him. Here it is in John 5, 39. Ye search the scriptures, and in them ye think ye have life, but they are they which testify of me. All things from Genesis to Revelation is all about Jesus and what Jesus is doing to restore humanity into relationship and fellowship with his God. All right, so the message is simple. Let's not overcomplicate it. Jesus' mission is to seek and to that which was, and what caused the loss? Now here it is in Genesis chapter 3, God comes, and he comes looking, and he's calling Adam, 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 where art thou? Because he's lost. He was hiding. And God set out on a mission to save that. Now, Jesus showed that his mission is to seek and to save that which was lost, because he said it in Luke 9, 19, verse 10. Did I get that right? I think so. His mission is to seek and to save that which was lost. And our mission is God's mission. Isn't that what the lesson title says? God's mission my mission. Now, if, God, if Jesus is mission, or Jesus is God, by the way, we're going to debunk that. We don't have to. Like Paul, we need not go back to the first principles. We already know that Jesus is God. John 1 did tell us that. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And John 1 is mirroring Genesis chapter 1. So we don't have to go back and just figure out, is Jesus God? We know that. And in Genesis 1, it tells us that the Spirit of God hovered over the deep. So we know the Spirit was there. And John tells us that all things were created by him, and without him not, was nothing made. So we know that Jesus was there, the Spirit was there, and the Father is always there. So we don't have to argue about that. But what we need to figure out now, Jesus' mission, our mission. And in Matthew 28... Jesus is giving them the Great Commission. Now, you should understand, as you've studied this week, that the lesson, the Old Commission, is, chron is written in all of the Gospels. But I like Acts' version. I like the way Luke do it. He finishes off telling the Great Commission story. Yes, this is your commission. But here's the problem. In none of the Gospel that Jesus says, wait. He says, go. You must do this. But Luke expound. You see, you cannot do this of your own. I have to empower you to do that which I have commanded you to do. Yes, sister. Yes. That's right. See, I, I love that. Say that again for the audience. I said God's mission is our mission. Right. It's not uh, our mission is God's mission. It, we have to align with his. I love his that. Mission. I love that. So if it is God's mission, that means he has the goals, the objective. It's his mission. He created it. He has the plan. So guess what? We have to get in line with him in order to execute his mission. Now, the beautiful thing about God is that God never gives a mandate that he does not first provide the resources to, ac to accomplish. He gives no order that we cannot execute. The problem is always we fail to use the resources available to us. The commission is given, but Jesus tells us how we will accomplish that. Tarry, he said, until you are endued with the Holy Spirit. So we said all of that by way of revision. So last week we look at uh, this week's lesson is part two of what we started. God's mission to us, part two. The lesson studied the memory verse. Can I have a volunteer for the memory verse? A volunteer. A memory verse comes to us from Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. And the Bible reads, Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, 
and the Son, and of and the, the Holy, Holy Ghost. Spirit. All right, that is the memory verse. Now, I'd like someone to, let's pick it up. For we always, when we talk about the Great Commission, we take it from what? Where do we take it from? Verse 18, right? Now I'd like you to read from verse 18. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. In fact, we should have our Bible. This is Sabbath school, and it's Bible study. Therefore, we need to have our Bibles. Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20. The Bible reads, And Jesus came and spake unto okay. them, saying, saying all, all power is given unto me in heaven right. and in earth. Go ye therefore, therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of, and the, of Son, the Son, and, and of, of the, the Holy, Holy Ghost, Ghost. Teaching, teaching them, them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And, and lo, lo, I am with, with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Amen. Now, some Bible use the word authority in, 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 in place of power. In my realm that I operate, there is a difference between authority and power. Can anybody share with me what's the difference between authority and power in terms of leadership, running, managing? What is the difference between leadership and author power and authority? <clears throat> All right, save time. Take notes. Authority is a figure, it's a position of, in of entitlement and shows some sort of a po position. I can be a manager, I have authority because of my title, the rank and position. And yet still, one of my subordinates has power and he gets work done that I can't get done. Power is the ability to get things done. Now Jesus is giving you not authority. Yes, you are, as leaders, you are in place of authority. But what you need is power to get things done. So the one who has the power, he is really the leader. He is in charge. Not necessarily the person in a position. Position is authority. Power, the ability to get done get things done. Now that's what Jesus gave them because that's what they're going to need to do the task that God has placed before them. So we look at the triune God and we, we, we stumble, but we already debunked the fact that yes, there is a trinity. Though the word is not in the Bible, the triune God is all through scripture. And they have functionality. They, in this thing of the plan of salvation, they have roles that they play. And it is, the privilege is given us to be like Jesus, to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, the lesson says our primary role, our mission, is to make disciples. But why are you making disciples? Speak back to me. It was in my prayer. Why are we making disciples? Why are we making disciples? All right. So take your Bible. Go to Romans chapter 10, verses 13, 14, and 15. Yes, sir. As I was just thinking, uh, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, yeah. I will fear no evil. That's right. Though you go through the water and the fire, I will be with you. Yes. So he said, I have the power, the authority to give you mm -hmm. the power to cast out all those demons, this and that. And then teaching to observe. Because oh, I bore it all for you. I went through. Uh -huh. So I'm with you. I'm the, I completed the mission. I want you to do the mission that I have for you. I've always said, thank you for sharing that, brother. I've always said, Jesus is the best teacher. You know, he tells us, but then he shows us how to. Yep. And for three and a half years, he was showing them by example. And then he said, I will send you the Holy Spirit. He will bring back to your memory all things that I have told you. That's just one of the jobs. He has many other jobs. But I have been telling you, but I've shown you by example. Because I tell you this, if I tell you, you may remember. If I show you, you will remember. I get you involved, 
you will remember. And so God, Jesus, was teaching them by example how you do missionary work, how you go about seeking and saving that which was lost. Now, we are in Romans chapter 10, verse 13. Romans 10, verse 13, what does the Bible say? Speak to me. Romans 10, verse 13. For whosoever, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall. shall be saved. That word shall is a definite article. If you call upon the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. And now you are going out so people can learn of him. Because here it is in Matthew 24, verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be right. So Romans 10, 13 says, Whosoever call upon him shall be saved. But watch this in verse 14. Verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Ah. And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? Stop. How Stop right there, sister. We're having Bible study. How can they call upon him who they don't know? Remember the Great Commission. You go and you're teaching them whatsoever things I have taught you. They cannot call upon him who they don't know. And how shall they know? Keep reading. And how shall they hear mm. without a preacher? Without a preacher. Now, the preacher is the disciple. is the one that has been commissioned to go. And when he goes, what is he bringing with him? What is he bringing with him? It is the gospel, the good news. Because Jesus said, it's all about me. And so as I'm telling about him, then you learn of him you are able to call upon him, and calling upon him, you might be saved. The whole purpose of discipleship is to call people into a right relationship that they might be saved. I have a hand in the back. I was just going to say, um, in the story of the demonics, we see that Jesus, when he healed them, he sent them back instead of him going back. So in a sense, he made them disciples because he knew that they could get to the people. But once they got to the people, then they did exactly what he wanted. They brought them back to him. So in our discipleship, it, we're not only going to seek and to save somebody else, but it's also helping us to be saved in the process. Praise God. Praise God. That is so true. It is helping us. Uh, see, uh, when I was in school, my uh, teachers, then my professors, tell me that, Alexander, you know a topic or you know the lesson when you are able to also share it or teach it. You want to know, and as, as, as Bible students, as we're studying and we, we get so excited about what we're studying, the way to really grow is to share that which you know. Stay with me. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, Jesus was the greatest teacher because he showed how to do things. Yes. And many times we fail today as teachers because we only teach by precept and not by example. So true. Praise God for that. Because Jesus tells us and then he shows us how. And not, that's by example. He shows us exactly how we ought to do it. Now, brother, I thank you for sharing that example. Because that's Jesus' method all the time. We find it in John chapter 4. When he had an encounter with the woman at the well, now she became a disciple because she went and she told the others, come, see, well, you see, that's the thing. That is what we ought to be doing as disciples. Come, see a man. The, uh, as the lesson taught, in the Old Testament, the people came to the children of Israel, the they came. Now, the commission to us is we are to go. And once we have an encounter with the living Savior, he doesn't have to tell us orally. We know, like Jeremiah, I just can't keep it shut up. It's like fire in my bone. 
And so you find the woman at the well, when she had an encounter with the risen Savior, the living, he wasn't risen yet, but he was always risen. He had an encounter with Jesus. She had an encounter with Jesus. She went to the town and said, come see a man who has told me all things. And then you keep reading it in that chapter, and they said, we believe not just because of your word, but as we bring people to Jesus, they have an experience with him themselves. And guess what? Those people now become disciples, and they go out and tell more people, come see a man who has told us all things. Verse 15 in, in Romans 10 says, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring the gospel of peace. And the peace, which is that it is the everlasting gospel. It is the everlasting gospel because it's not to just one group of people. Because in Revelation chapter 14, the Bible says, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made earth, the sea, and the fountains of... But before that, who was the message given to? Watch this, verse 6. Verse 6 says, And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto the Jews, to preach unto the Americans, to preach unto the Europeans, to preach unto the Indians only. The mission has always been the same. Because all people, no matter who you are, you came from one. Amen. We all came from Adam. If we believe in creation. But God created it. If you don't believe in creation, I can't help you. <laughs> See, I'm not that smart. And it takes a lot of smarts to believe in something but creation. I'm a simple guy. God said it, I believe it. That settles it for me. Amen. So the mission has always been the same. So let's go to the study because let's you say Alexander didn't walk us through our studies. We came to study and he, and he didn't do that. All right, so we look at the triune God. And we look at the triune God. Sunday's uh, uh, Topic to talk about the triune God, but in the responsibility, what are the roles of each God? Because I talked about, you know, God being this relational God. In Eden, God walked with us. In the wilderness, he said, Exodus chapter 25, verse 8, let them build me a sanctuary that I may. And in the New Testament, the Emmanuel, Jesus, came because he's always wanting to dwell with his people. And when he left, he has sent us his Holy Spirit. God always. And he, it is he who dwells in you. In Revelation chapter 3, here it is, the state where the church is today. Behold, I stand at the door. And why? Why? <laughs> when the people, when Moses wanted to meet with God, he went to the sanctuary because the Shekinah was there. And we said that the church is a sanctuary. And here it is. God is knocking because he's not in the church. Let them build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. It has always been God's mission to dwell with us. Now, in Sunday's lesson, let's talk about it. What is the role of God as the lesson brought out? What, what, what's the role of the Father? So each person of the deity has a role to play. The Father sends the Son. We see that in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave himself, his only begotten, that whosoever would believe might be safe. So we see the role of the Father. He sends the Son to redeem us and promised to send us the Holy Spirit. He sends the Son. Then he promised, after Jesus said, it is expedient that I go, because if I don't go, the Comforter cannot come. And so 
they all have their unique roles that they're playing in this old plan of salvation. What was the role of the, of the son? What was the role of the son? We studied. Speak back to me. What was the role of the son? Pardon me? That's right. He died. And as her sister told us last week, last week, God cannot die. Therefore, he had to take on humanity. He died, conquered death. Giving us that assurance. You see, these things are written that through, that through patient study of the scripture, we might have hope. What is, the world, what is the role now of the Holy Spirit? What is the role of the Holy Spirit? The, the lesson is really good, a good lesson. I, what I'm sharing is just supplementary to the lesson. It's a good lesson. Keep this quarter. It's one of the, your keepers, keepsakes. It's simple, and it is challenging us, just equipping us to be good saints. You know, uh, one of my favorite texts says, you know, we should sanctify the Lord in our hearts and be ready always to give an answer to everyone that asks of us a reason for the hope we have. But with that meekness, meekness. And so what is the role? The Holy Spirit has a lot of roles. So you tell me, what is one of the roles of the Holy Spirit? Because we talk about the role of the Father, He sent the Son. We talk about the role of the Son, He died and conquered sin and death. What is one of the roles, or two of the roles of the Holy Spirit? Speak back to me. Convict us of sin. To lead us into all truth. Lead us into all truth. That's one of the most important ones. Because there's so much faith and that's the very reason we have so many different denominations and we claim that we are all reading the same Bible. But not being guided by the Holy Spirit. See, the Bible is spiritual. And spiritual things are spiritually discerned. And the Spirit, it is He who guides us into all truth and righteousness. So we see that. And we have the challenge. Now, we read from the book, Council on Health, that the Godhead was stirred with pity for the race. And the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit gave themselves to the working out of the plan of redemption in order to fully carry out, out this plan. It was decided that Christ, the only begotten Son of God, should give himself an offering for sin. Now, before even man's sin, it was decided how we're going to execute this. Why? Because he's God. And he knows the end from the beginning. I need you to know that when you keep reading, even in the story of redemption, that it wasn't an easy decision for the Father. No, it wasn't. Grace is free to you, but it costs a lot to God. For you who think that just because you don't have a lot of worldly position attached to your name, you don't know how valuable you are to God. You know what you're worth to God? Do you know what you're worth to God? You're worth the best that heaven could bestow. You're worth the Son of God. The life of the Son of God. All right, we continue because the lesson was a good one. And so we look, the focus, making disciples. The focus is on making disciples. <clears throat> one of the things about, we know what our plan is and we know what we are to do. We get distracted and so we don't do it. We are to, every day, what is my mission? What is my focus? What? You know, the, it's, Jesus said, Thy will be done on earth even as it is in heaven. And if thy will is being done in my life today as it is in heaven, I will stay focused. But the adversary has a lot of distraction. And so we get caught up in all different distractions. Even the idea of knowing the problem and coming up with solutions for the problem when we are really not focusing on the problem. We are focusing so much more on possible solutions. We look at this... Uh, Course of action one, course of action two, and if we do this, it would require us to do this, and if we do that, and yet still, P 
People are dying and going to a Christless grave. And we are doing nothing to address the situation. But we're so focused on, the, on coming up with plans and we'll do fundraising to get money and we'll build an office to make sure we have the right people in place and we are never addressing the situation. It's simple. You had an encounter with Jesus? Go tell what Jesus has done for you. And tell them all things that I have taught you. Stay with the word. Because Jesus said, what I have taught you. And there's a lot of people making disciples. And you find all these different, let me not call them cult, because they will call us cult, other different groups. And they are having their disciples. And they are all saying and believing the same thing. Because they had not taught what Jesus said. Jesus said, teach them all things that I, the word of God, has taught you. And so, we look at the fact that we are to make disciples. Why we are making disciples? So people can call upon the name of the Lord that they might be. So, we look at the everlasting gospel, right? The Father determined that with the presence of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit, we would take the gospel to every human being on the planet. The, the, in the lesson, when you, we studied, and the author brings out the 12, even the 120 when, on the day of the Pentecost, they were not enough to spread the gospel throughout the entire world. But we find that here it is that we have a role. As we are discipled, we become disciples. And we go and make more disciples, and so we can spread the word of God that whosoever call upon the name of Jesus shall be saved. <clears throat> we look at the, the everlasting gospel, and we talk about what is the everlasting gospel. So what is the eternal gospel that we must preach to the entire world? What is that gospel? Acts 10, 38. Jesus came to our world and lived a perfect life. He sets the example. It is possible to overcome sin by the help or aid of the Holy Spirit. He died on the cross and bare our sins because the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And if that wasn't bad, we see all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, then by definition, all deserving. But God, Jesus, the good news is, yes, you were born in sin, shaping in iniquity. Yes, you have committed sin. Even if Adam did, even if God decided to cancel Adam's sin, the original sin, you have committed enough sin to die. But you don't have to. The good news, Jesus died for our sin. And as our brother shared, he died and conquered sin and death. He rose and ascend. Jesus, what he has done and what he is doing. What is Jesus doing for you today? He is? That's right, sister. Speak with confidence, even when you're wrong. Sound confident about it. He interceded for me. That's right, he is. He is interceding for us. And here's the promise. If he died, that's good. He's interceding. So what? Yes, he's interceding. But here is the, here is the promise. John 14, verse 1 through 3. You all know it because you're all Bible students. Ye believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it weren't so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for me, for you. Yes, Lord, we know you died, you went. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I sound like you believe the promise. And if you don't know it, here is it today. The promise of God is, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there he may be also. And you need to know, in Revelation, it tells you about that place. After we have made disciples, because 
people need to hear, and it shall come to pass that everyone that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And because we were obedient to be disciples, we went and we told them. And Jesus said, when this gospel of the kingdom is preached unto all the world, then shall the end come. And because we were obedient, obedient disciples, we told the world, and guess what? Jesus is coming. And when he comes, he said he's going to take you to be with him. And where he is, no more war. No more pain, no more suffering, no more lying, no more stealing, no more heartaches, no more death, no more suffering. That's the place. That is what we need to tell them. Things look bad today, yes. And guess what? It's going to get worse. But can I tell you the good news? Jesus is coming again. Nahum 1, 9. What do you imagine against the Lord? Iniquity shall not arise a second time. This is good news. We're supposed to be excited about it. Are you excited about being a disciple? Don't overcomplicate the lesson, please. The lesson is that Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. You have a job, an awesome responsibility. A privilege to be a disciple of God, to do what Jesus came to do. How beautiful are the feet of those who proclaim, who preach the good news of salvation. Now, to bring this lesson to a close, oh, let me pray and then we're going to sing a song. Our Father in heaven, how grateful we are and thankful for Jesus, the plan of salvation. It's complicated. It's the signs that angels desire to look into, can't rightly comprehend. But you've made it so simple that if we just believe, we shall be saved. You've given us this responsibility to preach, to proclaim the good news of salvation to all the world, beginning in Jerusalem, in our homes. Then to Samaria, those who are like us, but we may not like them for whatever reason. And then to the uttermost place of the world. What an awesome privilege. We do it through our media ministry. We do it through our door-to-door -door ministry. But we only do it through the power of Jesus Christ and the working of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for this awesome privilege, dear Father. We humbly submit ourselves this worship, this place, and all that is done around this place into your care and keeping, that our worship may be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Can you turn your hymnals and sing with me? Open our eyes. But we'll do the second and the third stanza. Because, yes, we want to see, but we have already seen. Now open our ears that we might hear. Sidat, can you play uh, Open My Eyes? We're doing the second and third standard while the singer is coming. Spirit divine, open mine ears that I may hear voices of thou sing. 